I've titled this sermon today, Great Calamities or Tragedies. Friends, what tragedies there have been in the history of our world. And in the hour in which we live in, like in this short account I've read, these tragedies are both from evil man and what we would call human nature. Both of the evil man or what we would call human nature. I would imagine this morning that there's no one in this room who cannot think of something or some sort of tragedy that has occurred within their lifetime. Within your lifetime this morning, even as I speak, you can think on those tragedies that have occurred. I would even suspect even our children this morning, that they can have some sort of idea to that which I'm referring to. And indeed they can, can they not? The last 18 months, whatever we make of it, has been a great tragedy. And friends, we know this. Our very youngest this morning in here, or today, who are playing with their toys, needing the eyes of their parents all the time upon them, will, without question, in the future, hear of tragedies and great, great calamities. You won't need me to remind you of such things, and I'm sure while the less would be exhaustive, the great fire of London in 1666, the sinking of the Titanic in 1912, the Great Depression 1929, all the way through to 1933. Of course, both world wars, 1914 to 1918 being the first, and the second 1939, all the way through to 1945. These are real. These things happened. Left great calamities, great tragedies. And of course, the event that has been all over the news this week, as it's been remembered, in my view very rightly remembered, of the Twin Towers, what is called 9-11, 20 years ago. I confess it was the watching of a BBC documentary this week called Survivors of 9-11 that made my mind think upon this text. And I've watched others throughout this week regarding that tragic day 20 years ago. It brought me to this text, brought me to this message. Like other events I've mentioned, no doubt many, many more, in fact, certainly many more. This, these inflicted turmoil on many lives. The lives of individuals, the lives of families, the lives of a nation, and arguably, the lives of a whole world. On September 11th, 2021, forgive me, most of us who were old enough in here, which I would say is the majority, will remember exactly where we were when this news came through. The tragic event shook the world. I would say, in my view, and I'm sure of many, that it changed the world. It changed the way in which even us in this small living, village live and continue to live. A great manifestation of evil was seen on every television screen. I said to Joy last night, as you watch that thing occur, you can watch it a thousand times and still be horrified the thousandth time of watching it. This tragic event did shake the world. And I think that we can easily say today 
it still has its effect, and those effects are clearly seen. On that day, within them two towers, 2,996 people lost their lives. That means, within a blink of an eye, within a moment, 2,966 families, 96 families, had a loved one taken from them and were never going to be the same again. Moms, dads, brothers, sons, etc., etc. Life in one moment changed. On that day, to my understanding, 25,000 injuries on that day were reported. Varying from minor to life changing. It wouldn't be uh, appropriate to go into those, but you can imagine the, the injuries that took place on that day. This affected so many people's lives, physically. And I would say, in my understanding of this, that these numbers that I give you would not be full. But these numbers I give you would not speak of those who were mentally and emotionally ruined on that day. A great calamity, without doubt. You see, when we think of these tragic events, it would be very difficult to list them. It would be wrong to try. We can speak of earthquakes. We can speak of forest fires. We can speak of other similar attacks regarding that of 9-11. Diseases, viruses, tsunamis. Again, if you remember that tsunami in 2004, 2,000, two, forgive me, 230,000 people's lives were washed away. Yes, within a moment. And again, maybe some of you here can remember the very day that came out. I think it was Boxing Day 2004. We were in Australia. Within a moment, great calamity. Again, I say to you this morning, these are real and these happen. You can think of other tragedies and other tragic stories or accounts. Think of famous people who are obviously in the public eye. Michael Schumacher, successful, rich, and wealthy man who is the best of the best within a moment in his in his uh, recreation, life changed. His head hits a rock. And even today, though there is privacy, and rightly so, of course, we can imagine how that man now lives. The breaking news over the last two weeks was a lady called Sarah Hardy. To some of you will be more familiar than me. He was in a pop band. An undiagnosed cancer. I was told then she had only months to live. 39 died. These, of course, are real. And even as I speak again, there will be multitudes of things this morning that we could refer to that are real, that have happened, where lives are no longer there because they have passed from this into the next. And of course, it wouldn't be right would it, to move on without saying those tragedies that are much closer to home. Those things to each and every one of our families. There have been tragedies. That death, that accident, that diagnosis. 
Friends, how we all could tell of the reality of these things and how they have affected us. What is the response of all this? But I can say for sure that my intention this morning is not to answer why, because I don't have the full answer. Neither do you. What is our response to this, or to all of this? And when I say our, what I mean by that word is, as Christians, what is our response to this? Of course, I would say that it would cause you and I to consider that question. Why, oh God, do these things come to pass? Why is it that that happened? I don't think you need to be a scholar or highly educated in theology to have a grounded answer. But I'll leave you with that thought. But more practically, what is it that we should be like, or how is it that we should respond both internally and externally? As fellow humans, and certainly as Christians, we ought to seek aid and help. As humans, as mankind, when we hear of such calamities, we are and ought to be affected. That's the human nature, to say the least. We ought to mourn and remember those most affected. I hope that we as a church, that sometimes are miles away from these calamities, can be encouraged to be a charitable people. A people of care, a people of kindness, and always be a people of willingness to bring aid. But friends, if we are to handle this text, with care, with honesty, we must then go further. Chapter 13, I'll read again the verse 5 verses. There were present at that season some that told him, in Jesus, of the Galilean, or the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus answered and said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans, because they suffered such things. I tell ye nay. No. But except ye repent, ye will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell, and slew them, think ye they that they were sinners above all men that were in Jerusalem? Jesus then answered again his own question, a rhetorical question. He says, I tell you no. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Friends, these are words of the Saviour. These are not my words. This is not an account of my life or your life. This is Holy Scripture. And we need to look at it through the eyes of honesty and say this. This is hard seemingly hard. We will consider today three very basic things. The question or the statement put to Jesus, the reply that Jesus gave, and what that means to you and to us as individuals, and as Russell was put in the front of that service sheet, to the life of this church, to the life of this church. Before we do that, let's consider these two events. These two events that here are recorded here in this passage. The mingling of blood and a tower that fell. The tower that fell and the mingling of blood. Friends, the reality is this. That there is very little information about these two events. Very little information. The scriptures do not divulge any more information 
and most <coughs> commentators or, or, or even those who would call themselves historians conclude that there's no further historical account of these stories. What we have, friends, is what is before you. This is the account, therefore, in Scripture, we take it as truth. There's no real further historical information. There's no, there's no six-page dialogue on what happened with the Tower of Silo. It's not there. But I believe, as I was preparing for this, I believe that is wonderful. Because what we could get caught up on is the detail of the events rather than what Christ is actually saying. So we haven't got that great dialogue to, to, for us to digest and miss the point. William Hendrickson says this about these verses or these events. He said it was impossible to be more specific. Neither Josephus, who was at the time around then, of a, he was a historian, nor any other sacred or secular, relates to this incident. All we really know is what Luke tells us here. Namely that while some people who lived in Galilee and had made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, listen to this, were busily engaged in offering their sacrifices in the te temple, they were suddenly cut down. They were murdered. Upon orders of whom? Of Pilate. Consequently, in some sense, the blood of these Galileans were mingled with these sacrifices. Gruesome in many ways. We know, don't we, that Pilate was cruel. We know that Pilate was cruel. We know that Pilate was a coward. We know that Pilate was a man who only thought of himself and his kingdom. So we have. <coughs> With regards to the falling of the Tower of Siloam, again, very little information is given. It is again suggested that this tower would have been near the pool of Siloam, inside the wall southeast of Jerusalem. Probably would have been a Turek that fell and killed 18 people. Again, friends, that's all really we have. So the question, or in some sense the statement that was made to Jesus here in verse 1 of chapter 13. We know that the context, again, which is always set here, is absolutely vitally important. Chapter 12 tells us that Jesus was addressing, you go to the beginning, you have to do it now, but if you go to the beginning of chapter 12, what you will see is a continuation who Jesus is addressing. Jesus is addressing an innumerable multitude of people. He's speaking to many people here. And as we read through the latter part of chapter 12, making our way in to chapter 13, Jesus is rebuking these people for discerning the weather. You can tell what the weather's going to be like. You can look at the sky and predict or, or make sound judgments what the weather is going to be like. Yet you cannot recognize the time you are in. In other words, you do not notice that the Son of God has come. He's dealing with them. Dealing with him. As we get further on into chapter 12, Jesus, in some senses, seemingly offers practical advice. Yet I'm sure here was speaking of being right with one another and before the one true judge. He says in verse 59 of chapter 12, I tell thee, thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid the very last night. will not be dealt with unless your sin is dealt with. Unless the debt is paid, you are chained. He's talking about judgment here. And then we, we go on into this chapter 13. And we will look at this within its context. We won't dwell today on, on chapter 12, but we will not ignore it. But it seems to me that these people then who have 
being addressed, some of them, as he said, they were present at this season, some that told him of the Galileans, some that came up to Jesus and either reminded him of this, gave him the information about this. What were they doing? Again, we ought not to dig, do too deep to, to presume something that isn't there, that they've just been de being dealt with. Now, all of a sudden, they are seemingly kind of deflecting what he's just said, trying to change this direction, maybe, of the conversation. He's told them of this tragedy. And I'll read to you from the ESV. The reply that Jesus gave. Jesus said, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all of these other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, said Jesus, I tell you, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. All those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders and all those who lived in Jerusalem, Jesus says again, no, I tell you, that unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all of the Galileans? Because they suffered in this way, again, as I keep repeating. All those in whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed, they asked, do you think that they were, or Jesus asked the people there, do you think they were worse offenders than all of those who lived in Jerusalem? To both questions, but Jesus asks, Jesus himself then gives the answer. No is the answer. No, these are not worse sinners. Forget that idea, forget that notion. But then again he turns the attention onto them. And I tell you, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. You see, if Jesus or the Jews coming to Jesus in their philosophy, in their beliefs. They thought that personal disaster is the result of personal sin. They thought something that happened that was so bad that it happened because they were worse sinners. You remember in John 9, they were asking why the boy was blind. Was it because the mother sinned or the parents sinned or because he sinned? And God, Christ has said, well neither actually is like this so that I can show my glory. Paraphrase. So these calamities, Jesus first of all makes it clear, these things didn't happen because they were worse sinners. Not at all. Jesus here refutes that notion twice. What Christ does, doubly affirm, is the need to repent. Unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Was Jesus saying, unless you repent, you too will walk into some calamity? That you also will be crushed by a tower? Is that what Christ is saying? We, of course, I would think that most would say, what a silly thought that would be. That wouldn't be right in the context of the gospel. But do you know what? Even within our own minds, we have looked on calamities, we have looked around and even applied in our own lives. That's happened to me because I am. Friends, it's not the case. This could go much deeper as you hear me, I'm sure. You, we could have a wide conversation of why these things do happen. The worst sinners, Jesus says no. Paul the Apostle says, I am the worst. And the worst of sinners. You see, friends, we have to get deeper than what we see on the surface. We have to consider much more what then is Jesus saying? What is, he, what is happening in this seemingly one-way conversation? Jesus is dealing with these people. Let us first know that Jesus is not avoiding the reality of this great calamity that has taken place. Whether it had recently taken place, whether it had previously taken place, who knows? 
But this had taken place, and we know, don't we, those of us who have been so familiar with the scriptures, that the Jesus to whom is saying these words is a Jesus who is the Christ, who is full of compassion and full of mercy, particularly for the poor, particularly for the weak, particularly for the afflicted. So this Jesus here is not ignoring what has been happening. What Jesus is doing is dealing with something that is eternal. What Jesus is doing is saying, what about you? Have you yet repented? Are you ready yet to face death? Be sure it can come in a moment. I think that Christ is saying this, the state of your soul today is and should be your first concern. J.C. Wright made an interesting comment. He said this, so if you have, if this twitches you a little bit, do go to J.C. Wright, not me. <laughs> but have you ever noticed, he says, we, including myself of course, we as men, or we as mankind, are happy to talk about the death of others, yet avoid to talk of our own. That's what these people are doing, really. What about this? What about that? That Jesus in his love, and I hope that you see that, Jesus in his love for these people speaks to their soul in that moment and at that time. We can be people who are often, and we are all guilty, we can speak of the re seeming realities of others. As I have already tried to put across to you today, that these tragedies happened, that these people on that day were alive, they went to work alive, and they never came home. And I don't, I want to confess, I don't see the reality of it. I don't. Because I'm a 38 year old healthy, reasonably healthy man. But this happens. That Jesus in his love to these people said, yes, this happened. Yes, this was tragic. Yes, but what about you? What about you? Jesus here makes no room for the neglect of your soul. And does not allow any room for your Neglect of your eternal future. Is that harsh? I would say it is one of the most loving things that one can ever do. And we're praying for converts who the night down coast of Jude pull them from the fire. Friends, I tell you what, with the fire breaking out now, any good man in this room would get every woman and child out there as soon as they possibly could. Why? Because they care. And we talk of something far greater than that. We to speak of your soul this morning, whether it's the youngest in our room or the oldest in this room, it will meet with God. It will meet with God. So what does this then mean for you? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for us as a church? For you? You've heard it, Jefferson. Have you heard it enough for God to determine? If you have heard, you will hear from this pulpit that great question. Why? Because we must. Why? Because we should. Why? We cannot and should not do any other. Your eternity depends upon this question, or rather, your eternity depends on the answer to this question. Have you yet repented? As I went through the thoughts of all of what I have watched this week and considered, educating myself, I hope, I asked that question of myself. And I asked a question that I haven't yet fully grasped because the scriptures that Russell has been going through says two things to believe and repent. Believe and to repent. Now I leave you with that kind of anger. Because I'm working that out myself. Let me say this. 
Satan, this hour, the leaves has gone. But there's no repentance. Have you repented? Have you, have we, we were in the city, the city, the town of Chesterfield on Friday. I'll go into that maybe a little bit more. But by God's help, we call men and women to repent. Why? Because if they don't, they will likewise perish. We can stand and remember, and I am an advocate for that remembrance, I am. But unless you repent, you too will likewise perish. What does it mean to perish? Friends, the scripture is clear about the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. I leave you with that. I could exhaustively go on about that. But I believe, particularly over the, the month gone by, that you have been called to believe and repent upon Jesus Christ. You've been called. I don't think that even people know what repentance means. My children, and you know, here they are, the pastor's kids, say, I'm sorry. They're in trouble again. I say again, as if the role is in trouble. The Bible is dressed in not always in trouble. But they are in trouble. And they say, Daddy, I'm sorry. Or Dad, it's becoming Dad now, by the way. <laughs> Dad, I'm sorry. And sometimes they have to hear this. You're sorry only because you want to stay late up tonight. You're not sorry. That's not repentant for me. To be sorry is very much inclusive, of course. But repentance means to change your ways. To have a different heart. To have a different mindset. I once lived for sin, but now I'm going in the absolute other direction. I don't want it anymore. I am changed. That's what repentance means. Repentance doesn't mean that just because you come to each service... It means a heart change. And I was thinking again in my preparations, and as I pray that they were praying as a family, I said, I said to, uh, I pray that our hearts will be changed. And then I thought, this, I don't need a heart that's changed. I need a new heart. I don't need a changed heart. I need a new one. I need one that now loves Christ with every fiber of my being. Have you been given that today? Have you repented of your sin? Because I say this not because you need another message on it. I say it first of all because the scriptures demand it. And if we in the last 18 months, whatever personal tragedy you have had or we have had, the reality is this, that you know, you know that even those to whom you have loved are now not with us and they have met their maker. So this message is vital. So I ask, with the question I ask, we will ask, for you, it's simple. Have you yet repented? Have you yet turned? And I leave the words of John the Baptist with you, bring forth fruits of your repentance. For as a church, as a church, Again, I think our ecclesiology, I'll use a posh theological term, we've got lots to learn about the body of Christ. So much to learn. I've got so much to learn. But as a church, and I believe that by His grace we are growing, by His grace we are learning, by His grace we are going forward. But as a church, what does it mean for us? This small church in this small village, Friends, as I watched this documentary on these events that took place 20 years ago in America. As I watched the poor people decide whether it would burn or jump. Tears filled my eyes. When I heard the fireman explaining how he was the only man of his staff that morning who got through the day. Twelve of his men there that morning having breakfast, and by the end of the day it was only him who had life. And how told of his story and his obvious brokenness and his emptiness and his hopelessness, my throat goes dry. 
When I listened to mums on how they had to sit and tell their little children that daddy isn't coming home, I thought of my own. And of course you know well as I that I could go on and on and give tragic examples and sad things that occurred that day. But friends, what about this? As I watched that documentary and thought on it truthfully for days, I asked how many were unrepentant. Yeah. How many of them that day, as hard, and I stand before you, battling this in my own mind, how many of them that day went into outer darkness forever? Let me put in a footnote that the judge of all has to be right. He always was right. But that day, friends, as tragic as it was, and as horrifying as it was, for some, that was it. Sad is the reality. These tragic events are, friends, there's something far, far, far worse. Far worse to go into death, to enter in without repentance. Friends, that's worse. And this, though it be hard, must be said. We hear it said, don't we, that by the believers, we've probably all said it, and I don't mean in any way to be critical, I'm sure we'll say it again. But we can say, can't we, he died peacefully. She went peacefully regarding unbelievers. I want to say to you, friends, no one outside of Christ or no one outside of repentance dies peacefully. Quietly, maybe, but not peacefully. It would be better to burn in a furnace of fire being one of repentance than being an unrepentant man or woman who dies quietly in his sleep. So church, what do we do? I don't know what you think as I hang that question over you this morning. And this is very simple. The answer is this. We must give the good news of the gospel. We must give the good news of the gospel. We must, and I hope you get the gravity of it this morning, we must call men and women to repentance. We must. We speak. We don't only speak of life, but we do speak of death. So I ask a question, church. What do we do? Friends, we must evangelize. We must evangelize. Does your neighbor know you're a Christian? Does your work colleague know that you are Christ's soldier? These are seemingly small things, but I want to say they're profoundly big. Church. That's church. That church is the nice white walls around you know. They can't evangelize. The chairs, it's another subject. They cannot evangelize. You are the church. You are the church. If you are Christ, you are the part of the body. What must we do then? We must evangelize. Men and women, even now, are perishing in their sin. Is your way of life more important than that? You might say to me, I'm not a preacher. I'd say I'm not asking you to be. I'm not asking you to be a preacher. Tell your family. Everyone around this room today has unbelieving family. Tell them of Christ. Tell your friends. Tell the butcher. Tell the baker. Tell them of Christ. Tell them that Christ died for them. Tell them that you must repent and believe this gospel. You might say, I can't talk. I can't really communicate that well. And again, say, so you don't need to. God will do that. Moses said that. 
You might say, what then can I do? How about give? You say, what? I say, what about give? How about throw everything into the gospel? How about sacrifice? How about this? How, what can I do? How about pray? How about hold the rope? I was so encouraged Friday. We went to Chesterfield, five of us. Brilliant. But the amount of people, probably another handful, came up to me and said, know this, we were praying for you. Friends, I said, the important as one who was opening their mouth before they were sent. Vital. We speak of what can we do? What must we do as a church? We must give, we must pray, we must serve. Do those menial tasks. No one's above menial tasks, friends. No one's above making sure that, that room is tidy and clean. No one's above that, are we? We're a church of Jesus Christ. And I want to say to you humbly, I believe in these things we are growing, but we have much more room to improve. To serve one another. You might not be out there on a Friday in Chesterfield. But I tell you what, you might be back here making sure there's a home to come back to. And you might be on your knees interceding. And you might be a people who have a deeper pocket than the rest. Give. Yeah. Not to make sure people get rich, but know that the gospel is advanced. Someone came to me on Friday and said, Can I buy another bunch of leaflets so I can go into my own village? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's some of those friends, and I'll tell you what, you can shoot me down. You can even have a vote and get rid of me if you please. But some of us are grasping and holding everything closed because we're too afraid to give. We don't want to be at prayer meetings. We don't want to intercede because what we want is church unity, friends. If that is the case, then maybe this isn't the church for you. Because we need to be proactive. We need to serve one another in its true sense. For the gospel. And for Christ's sake, not for my sake. And I say again, yeah, not even for the sinner's sake, but for the glory of God, who will save his people. And as we say often, on that great day, friends, when there is a great feast, when we are enjoying God forever, there will be no seat empty. But why this day, friends? Why this day? I ask that you will join me. I came into this church this morning so not wanting to be here. So feeling unworthy and unprepared to speak to you, dear folks. But friends, there are sheep out there and we must be a church that labour, that go out and we bring them in. Christ. Amen.